morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Bethlehem. This morning is the last Sunday in the Epiphany season. So throughout the season of Epiphany, we've been focusing on the theme uncovered and how the truths of God's kingdom are uncovered through Jesus. Today we'll see uh, glory uncovered, lasting glory. And what's interesting is that in God's kingdom, lasting glory is uncovered when it's covered. So we'll be talking about Jesus' transfiguration today. We'll follow the order of service printed for you in the service folders and also up on the screens. May God bless our worship together this morning as we begin with the opening hymn. stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let's confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved others. 
I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You can be seated as we continue with us two songs from our Sunday school. The first one is Shine, Jesus, Shine, and you're invited to sing for the verses, and the Sunday school will join for the refrains.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. God, in the transfiguration of your only Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In your mercy, you make us co heirs of glory with Jesus our King and bring us at last to heaven. morning our three readings all are tied together by the theme of glory. So in our first reading from Exodus chapter 34, God gives his Old Testament people um, a covenant and it's summed up in the words of the Ten Commandments. These, he says, um, I'll be your God and these are the things that I expect of you as my people. Another word for this covenant is God's law, his rules for what to do and what not to do. And we'll hear in our second reading how this covenant is tied to the second covenant, the new covenant made with Jesus in the gospel. The reading from Exodus 34. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded... They saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. This is God's word. Now we'll join together to sing uh, Psalm 2, Great Are the Works of the Lord.
our second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This will be the basis for this morning's message. And here the Apostle Paul connects what happened in our first reading to what will happen in our, our gospel reading. And he explains the purpose of God's law and the purpose of God's gospel. Those two ministries. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry, of the, the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious had no glory, has no glory now, in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away, but their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is God's Word. Now we'll continue with the children's message, so any kids that want to come forward for that can come and gather here in the front. morning. I thought I would try something a little bit different today, but I wanted to test it out with you guys first and see what you think. Um, So what do you think of my sunglasses? Do you think this is a good time to wear sunglasses? No. No? No? No, Nobody? Because it's not sunny in here? It's a little bit silly to wear sunglasses inside? So that's why, you, that's why you wear them, right? You wear them outside when it's sunny. You might wear them today because it's a little bit sunny, but you don't wear them normally inside, right? Well, today we're going to hear in a second a story about Jesus and how he kind of took off his sunglasses in a way. So we're going to see Jesus with his face shining like the sun. Normally, he looked just like anybody else, but at a time when he was here on earth, his, he went up on a mountain with his disciples and his face started to shine like the sun. And it showed something about him. So what did it show about Jesus? Sydney? You don't know? What were you, you going to say? What did that show about Jesus? He wasn't just a man, but he was also... Who else was he? He was also the Son of God. Yeah, he was showing that to his disciples. And he's showing that to us. Jesus is not just a human being. He's also the Son of God. And then what he did after that is he covered up his glory again. And he went down the mountain. And he went to... Where did he go next, do you think? He went to another hill called Mount Calvary. Do you know what happened on Mount Calvary? Jesus died on the cross, right? Jesus covered up his glory as the Son of God, and he died on the cross for you and me. So when we think of, if you saw Jesus' face shining like the sun, how would you feel? That's a good question. We're not going to talk about it right now, but it's a good question. What would you think if you saw somebody's face shining like the sun? How would you feel? Maybe happy. Maybe it would be cool. It would be really cool. 
yeah, you're going to get sunburned, you'll be scared, right? And Jesus' disciples were scared too. And when we think about seeing God, it's kind of a scary thing because we know that God's perfect and that we're sinners. But Jesus covered up his glory that he could show us that he is our Savior from sin, that he died for his sins, and that God loves us. Sydney? Yeah, that would be bad. Yeah. So Jesus is our Savior from sin, and he shows us his glory so that he can then go and save us. We're going to hear more about that in a second, but we'll fold our hands and pray. So we're going to bow our heads and fold our hands, and we're going to pray. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Thank you for showing us his glory as your son so that we can know that when he died on the cross, he did that for you and me to take away our sins. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up. You can go back to your seats, and we'll continue with our gospel reading. So our gospel reading today is from Luke chapter 9. This is the account of Jesus' transfiguration. Please stand. About eight days after Jesus said this, what this is talking about is he confessed that he was the Messiah, that he was the Savior. At eight days after this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud, saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. This is the gospel of the Lord. You can be seated.
The basis for this morning's message is the, it's the words that you heard from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 a few moments ago. Friends in Christ, Sixteen people packed into a tiny airplane. They were crammed in like human sardines. They felt a bump as the plane landed, but their journey was only just beginning. For the next two weeks, they would hike 40 miles to the base of a mountain that they were about to attempt to summit, Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain. By the time they reached the base camp, they were already at 17,000 feet higher than any of the mountains in the Rocky Mountains. They'd stay there for the next two months, getting used to the altitude. If they went on too early, their brains and their lungs could swell dangerously. Eventually, they'd make their way to the next camp and then to the next, and by these next camps, the, the air is so thin that they can't sleep. It feels like breathing through a straw while running on a treadmill. That's how one person described it. So by the time it, the time comes for them to actually try to summit Mount Everest, they'll be exhausted, their muscles will have atrophied, they'll have, have insomnia. There are only a few days when you can reach the top, so they'll find themselves in a lineup of hundreds of other hikers as they enter the death zone, where the oxygen is so scarce that even with supplemental oxygen, their vision will still go blurry, they'll have headaches, dizziness, and nausea will set in. The hike to the top, it's a seven-hour hike, you have to do it in a single day or you could die. And as they're doing it, they'll pass the bodies of other hikers that have died doing it. It'll be easy to spot. They're wearing bright hiking clothing. Some of them have been there for decades, frozen there in time. And those bodies will be a reminder to every one of those hikers that that could be them. One in 20 people who try to climb Mount Everest, who try to summit Mount Everest, die doing it. It cost about $60,000 to attempt the climb Mount Everest, $60,000 for a 1 in 20 chance of dying. Why would anyone do that? Well, the people who try, they're, they're people who are risk takers, they're thrill seekers, they're, they're people who are confident in themselves, they believe that they have control over their own fate. There was a psychologist who talked about it, he said there are a lot of dead bodies on Everest, and yet the people who try are confident that it won't be, they won't be one of them. Instead, they are confident that summoning Mount Everest is going to be one of the most glorious, one of the greatest accomplishments in their lives. So it's all about achieving glory, isn't it? And today is all about achieving glory too. Now the Bible uses that word glory a lot. It shows up 17 times just in our second reading today. When the Bible talks about glory, it's talking about something that is important, that demands recognition, something that is impressive, that has a weight to it, weightiness, gravitas, something whose presence, someone whose presence itself just demands to be recognized. And people instinctively need, want glory. So kids are always looking for attention. They're always saying, look at me. Look what I can do. And adults, too, are always seeking recognition and to be noticed and paid attention to by the people whose opinions matter to us. We need glory. And today, God tells us how that glory is achieved, but it's not what we'd expect. In fact, it's the complete opposite. God tells us that in His kingdom... Glory comes through gospel ministry. Or to put it a different way, glory comes from staring at the sun. S-O-N, sun. Glory comes through gospel ministry. That's another word that shows up four times right away in our second reading today. Paul talks about the ministry of death and condemnation and the ministry of 
the spirit and of righteousness. That's a word, ministry, that we use a lot in church, but we don't always define it. So let's take a moment to define it. What is ministry? When the Bible talks about ministry, it's talking about service. But it's not just any kind of service. It's not service done out of obligation, like, like serving a prison sentence for a crime. It's not service done for personal gain or profit, like serving at a restaurant. It's not done for recognition. Ministry is service that's done for another person out of love. Ministry is done out of love. So we've been calling ourselves recently, the last few years, Bethlehem Lutheran Ministries, right? And that's, first of all, because it's a little easier to say than Bethlehem Lutheran Church and School and Early Learning Center. But second, because that's what we exist for, right? We exist for ministry. First of all, to have God serve us in love and then to go out and serve each other in love and our community in love. So we say Bethlehem Lutheran Ministries and we're thinking of a church, a school, and an ELC. But if you wanted to be technical about it, there are really just two ministries that we as a church exist to carry out. And they're the ministry of the law, what Paul calls the ministry of death and condemnation, and the ministry of the gospel, what Paul calls the ministry of the spirit and of life. Law and gospel. God's law... It's written on every human heart. So we instinctively, we know what right and wrong are. Although our conscience, and that law in our hearts, is clouded by sin. It's imperfect. God's law is also written in God's word, especially summed up in the Ten Commandments. Those letters written on those two stone tablets that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. His expectations for his people. God's gospel, though, is it's not written on human hearts. So we never figure it out on our own. The only way to know the good news is by God sharing it with us. So Paul is writing about these two ministries, the law and the gospel, and he's trying to help us understand how they work together. And he's writing it to the people, the Christians living in a city called Corinth. This is a congregation that he founded congregation that he had moved on from. And since he had moved on from that church, some other ministers had come in. And they'd set up kind of a rival ministry to his. They'd set up this ministry that was all law-based. So they said that Paul, Paul was too easy on the Corinthians. He gave them too much gospel. You can never expect to, to change to transform, to find glory by just having it handed to you, they said. You should have to work for it. So they set up expectations for the Corinthians. They gave them ways to distinguish themselves, to achieve glory for themselves. And the Corinthians almost bought into this. It came naturally to them to believe that this could be true. That glory isn't something that's just handed to you. It's something you have to achieve and earn for yourselves. They set the law in opposition to the gospel. And this is something that churches can do today too that we can easily do ourselves because it's built into us to want to achieve glory, to want to get glory for ourselves and to think that we're capable of getting it. So we can just, just as easily make church about achieving glory by our efforts. By doing service to get recognition for ourselves or to gain things for ourselves or out of some obligation that we feel. So Paul seeks to set the record straight, seeks to help us to understand the real place that the law and the gospel have. He says they're not opposed to each other, they actually work together. They're like act one and act two of God's story of our lives. So in Act 1, in the ministry of the law, that act ends in death and condemnation. So the way it works is, if you think that you can find glory for yourself, lasting glory, then you can try, but no matter how many mountains you summit, no matter how many things you achieve, you'll always find a higher mountain. There will always be something greater 
to achieve. You'll never reach the top. You'll always fall short at some point. You'll always reach a point where your strength runs out. There's nothing more you can achieve. And you find that you, just like every other person who has ever attempted to find glory in this way, have fallen short of the glory of God. The law, Paul says, is glorious, but it brings glory to God and not to us. It shows that God's right and we're wrong. We claim to be able to achieve glory for ourselves. We claim to be able to We're capable of lasting glory, of obeying Him in every way. But it's not true, is it? We're confronted with God's law, especially in those Ten Commandments, and He shows us that if we really wanted to earn our way to glory, then what we would have to do is not just summit one of each of those mountains, but all ten of those mountains. We'd have to love God and listen to Him and honor Him, but also love human beings and listen to Him to authorities and honor others and honor marriage and, and speak well of others and think well of others. And when we realize that, we realize that it's not possible for you and me. And we die. We stand before God's Ten Commandments and we stand condemned. And the thing that Paul wants us to realize is that is entirely the purpose of God's law, of that ministry of the law, to kill and condemn sinners. So if you set up a ministry that's only that, it can only end in death. And so we need that show to go on, so to speak. We need Act 2. We need the, the gospel ministry to follow that law. When we realize that we can't save ourselves, we need to hear about what God has done for you and me. Now, gospel ministry, it's not written on two tablets of stone. It's not written with ink. It's not chiseled in. But it's written on an old rugged cross, like this one that sits in the front of church. It's written in the blood of God's Son, His holy and precious blood. In the gospel ministry, we find out that we don't need a savior who goes up on the mountainside and his face shines like the sun and we cower in fear like those disciples. We need a savior who not only is that, but who also comes down to us, who reaches us in the depths of our sin and who goes even further, who suffers hell for you and me. We need a Savior who will do and do not all of God's commandments, who will keep the law in our place and will not fall short. We need not a Savior whose face shines like the sun, but we need a dead Savior. You, the only thing that will make you a living person is a dead Savior. A condemned Jesus is the only kind of Savior that will make you righteous. So Paul calls the ministry of the gospel the ministry of the Spirit and of righteousness. He says the Spirit brings life, life that doesn't end in death. And the Spirit brings righteousness. He clothes you with what Jesus did for you, his obedience. So when God looks at you now, he sees what he said of his son. He sees someone, he says, you are my son, you are my daughter, whom I love. The ministry of the gospel brings lasting glory in the last way we'd expect. Not by us serving God, but by God serving us. God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Dying for our sins and calling us to faith and giving us life. So let's go back to that first question. What, how can you and I achieve glory? Not just temporary glory, but lasting glory. We, we can't. We will never be the sun. We'll never be able to conjure up our own 
glory for ourselves will only ever be like the moon, reflecting the glory of God's sun as we stare at that sun, as we contemplate his glory, what he's done, and we're transfigured to look more and more like him by his spirit. And that's what Paul ends our reading today with. And let's end today's message with that as well. Paul says, We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed. And it's the same word here as transfiguration. We're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Why don't we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us lasting glory in your Son. Not through your Son up on the mountainside, his face shining like the sun, but through what he did as he covered his glory and died on the cross for our sins. Help us to find in Jesus the true power of your spirit, the true power to change and to grow together as we carry out the ministry of law and gospel here at our congregation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we'll confess our Christian faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated and we'll continue with the offering. During that time, please take a moment to sign the connection card. We'll also watch this month's edition of the Wells Connection. President Mark Schrader. Big versus small. When it comes to schools, we might assume that big schools have more opportunities, while small schools have a friendlier atmosphere. But Michigan Lutheran Seminary doesn't fit the mold. Instead, it offers the best of both worlds. It's homecoming at Michigan Lutheran Seminary with all the excitement and school spirit that you might expect. While this event has all the hallmarks of a big school game, Michigan Lutheran Seminary is better known for its small school atmosphere as a place where everyone knows your name. It's really nice just because you have such like a family bond with like everyone here. Everyone is just so welcoming and it feels like you just have a lot of siblings. Many of the students live in dormitories, which fosters lifelong relationships with friends who share a common faith in Jesus. It's just like the best place. Like you're surrounded by other Christians and all your friends go here too, so it's really nice. We gotta trust each other. Like much larger schools, Michigan Lutheran Seminary has a full slate of extracurriculars and a wide range of off-campus experiences to help students learn to express their Christian faith in many different settings. They have opportunities to go out into congregations and schools uh, to shadow a pastor, to learn from a teacher in the classroom, to really get that hands-on experience so they can say, I love this. Skeleton, we talked about it on the video. 
On campus, students also have unique opportunities to learn about the world, including through the first-hand stories of the school's many international students. Andy Liu, for example, was barred from worship in his home country, China. I definitely do appreciate this a lot because back in China, we, we had to hide our Bibles. The government actually found out that our school was teaching about the Bible, so they actually shut it down. There are people on our campus that don't believe they fit in. Studying the Bible, learning to share the Savior, remains at the core of Michigan Lutheran Seminary's purpose. That mission is most visible in Twice Daily Chapel. But it's part of every class, every activity here. As a preparatory school for high school age students, this campus is dedicated to preparing the next generation of pastors, teachers, staff ministers, and missionaries. I would really like to teach music or maybe elementary, but helping them grow in their faith, I just, that just seems so, just an amazing gift to be able to help them. So, can you tell me, what are some things that we notice? While visitors to this school might first notice the state-of-the-art facilities, anyone who spends time here will see something much bigger, the love of Christ that guides every hour of every day, with a special goal of shepherding the next generation of leaders who will serve you at your congregation and around the world. Michigan Lutheran Seminary has a positive student-to-faculty ratio, which means the faculty and staff get to know each student as an individual, modeling the kind of one-on-one -on -one care and commitment that called workers bring to congregations like yours. continue now with the responsive prayer. We include a couple of additional prayers today. Um, one on behalf of the family of Ginny Radickel. Uh, Ginny was the oldest member of our congregation. She was 95 years old, but she was called to her heavenly home this past week. Uh, her funeral will be held on Wednesday at the funeral home in Hortonville. Um, so we'll have a prayer for her family. Um, also a prayer of thanksgiving for Dave Abling, who had successful surgery this past week pray as he recovers from that, and a prayer uh, for Pat and Dick Schrader, who celebrated their 59th wedding anniversary this past week, and a prayer for uh, Ukraine, the people living there, uh, the people, um, our brothers and sisters in the Ukrainian Lutheran Church, that's our sister church body over in that country, and also the, uh, the U.S. service people who are over on the border of Poland. Um, including Matthew Belial, who's a grandson of Len Belial. So we keep them in our prayers today as well. So join in the responsive prayer. We pray not just for this church, but the church of Christ throughout the world and for all people. Heavenly Father, your son Jesus revealed his glory to Peter, James, and John. God, your sun shines in resurrected light. Illuminate your church with his brightness. Lord, you once appointed Moses to lead your people, and you sent your son Jesus to found and lead your church. Almighty Father, you alone establish all authority on earth. Bless those entrusted with this responsibility, both here and abroad. Let them serve you with integrity and honor and for the well-being of all. Heavenly Father, comfort the family of Ginny. You've called home to glory in heaven. We praise you for having made her your child in baptism and sustaining her faith through the good news about Jesus, her Savior. 
Thank you for the blessings you brought to your church, this community, and her family through her life of Christian service. And may the peace and promise of your son's sacrifice on the cross and his empty tomb bring assurance to the hearts of all who mourn. Gracious Lord, healer of diseases, thank you for blessing Dave with recovery from his surgery. And we ask that you would continue to give him that recovery and we give you thanks for the physical and spiritual strength you, you are giving him in this time of affliction. And eternal God, your love endures forever. With mercy and might, you have sustained Pat and Dick Schrader with blessing upon blessing as they now give you thanks for 59 years of marriage. Preserve their faith by your word, consecrate their hearts to your service and to each other, and lead them forth in your peace as they continue their lives together. Finally, Father in heaven and Lord of creation, in your mercy we ask your favor on Ukraine, a country that is now engulfed in war. Watch over those in peril, comfort the prisoners, relieve the suffering and the wounded. We ask that you would especially keep our brothers and sisters in the Ukrainian Lutheran Church close to you by the power of your word. In the midst of conflict, let your word continue to work and continue to be preached and spread. Let sin be repented of and turned to, and, and Jesus turned to by the power of your Holy Spirit through the gospel. Also be with our service members who are over on the border as they continue to uh, serve the people there. We ask all these things in the name of your son Jesus, in whose name we also pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when we gather next in worship, it will be Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. On that day, we will begin our solemn journey to the Savior's cross. While the joy of faith, faith remains undiminished throughout the year, our rejoicing during Lent is muted and quiet. For centuries, therefore, Christian churches have omitted their most jubilant songs during this season, including the word Alleluia, which means praise the Lord. Now for a time we say farewell to Alleluia. We do this to prepare ourselves for the quieter days of Lent. The Alleluias will return on Easter dawn as we gather to shout our praise to the risen Savior.
Good morning once again. Just a couple of announcements this morning. Um, a couple of things going on this week. On Tuesday night at 6 p.m., we're starting a new Bible basics class. Uh, so it was, a, it was supposed to start last Tuesday, but the snow and the weather uh, made us postpone to this week. So if you know anybody that might be interested in that, or if you yourself are interested in coming, that's Tuesday at 6 p.m. here at church. Uh, then Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. Uh, so we'll have services at 3.30 and 6.30 with a meal in between. And that'll start around 4.30 after the first service. That's sponsored by our Sunday school. Um, and then next Sunday is the recognition dinner. We'll recognize a number of people for their service to our congregation and to the church. Um, you can sign up for that out in the hallway on the tall table out by the coat rack. Uh, sign up for that so we get an idea of who is going to be there for that. Uh, but everyone's welcome to join. Um, and those are all the announcements that I have this morning. You can find the rest of them in the news and notes. God's blessings on the rest of your week.